Okay, so we will be talking about the adult primary brain tumors for the USMLE step one, extremely high yield. Uh, you will receive one or two questions in your exam uh, about the adult primary brain tumors. And, and I will make a separate lecture for your pediatric brain tumors, but for this one, I will just focus on the adult tumors. So uh, first and foremost, what I want to mention is whenever you receive a question about uh, tumors in adults with sign symptoms of your, let's say the regular sign symptoms, which are your morning headaches, uh, seizure, personality changes, memory problems, and your focal neurological deficits. When the tumor enlarges, it compresses certain central nervous system nerves, and it produces those symptoms. And if it's an adult with which the question presents with, then I want you to realize that they want the answers coming from the six primary brain tumors over here until and unless they mention that um, the patient had a previous history of another, uh, let's say, tumor or a malignancy in, the, in his or her body. And in that case, um, the question will direct you to a secondary metastasis to the brain, which is relatively more common for brain tumors. But if there are none, that, and they are talking about primary brain tumors then and and if it's an adult your question will uh, your answers will lie from one of the six over here so the first thing which you have to have in your mind is whenever uh, they are talking about an adult primary brain tumor it will be either a glioblastoma oligodendroglioma meningioma hemangioblastoma pituitary adenoma or uh, schwannoma and uh, the way I try to remember this is, uh, so I see a question stem where they paint a scenario of a brain tumor. Uh, I mean, uh, where, yeah, where they uh, paint a scenario of a patient who has the sign symptoms of a brain tumor and it's an adult patient. I immediately think about the six primary brain tumors. So I use a certain mnemonic for this one, which I mentioned over here. So. Over here, what you can see are your first uh, digits, I mean, the first letters of each tumors, which are G-O-M-H-P-S, which stands for glioblastoma multiforme, oligodendroglioma, meningioma, hemangioblastoma, pituitary adenoma, and your schwannoma. And the way I try to remember uh, the six letters is uh, get out my head pains. <clears throat> get out my head pains. So for get out, you have your G-O, M H P N S. So this is how I try to remember uh, the adult primary brain tumors. Uh, you can either come up with your own mnemonic, but I highly suggest that you memorize or keep in mind that when it's an adult, uh, the USMD will test you whether you know that it's an adult tumor because they will have other mentions of the pediatric brain tumors in your answer stem. Let's say they will paint you a picture of an adult with a, with a primary brain tumor, and they will mention in the uh, answer stem that there is that it could be an ependymoma, uh, medulloblastoma, pilocytic astrocytoma. But if it's an adult patient, then it's none of these. It's actually one of the six. So having said that, let's start with our first tumor, which is your glioblastoma multiforme. Uh, one of the most important and the most common malignant primary brain tumor in adults, and more often than none, you will receive a question from glioblastoma multiforme. And um, I highly suggest that you don't skip out any words or letters from this section of the table over here. And as I mentioned before, uh, this part of the table is, uh, I'm sorry, let me just do that again. This part of the table is what the question will present with, or the question will also present with your patient scenario with this picture over here, or this picture over here, which is your pathological report and your scan. 
So the way you can remember uh, glioblastoma multiforme is it's um, grade four astrocytoma. Uh, astroci astrocytoma are basically your uh, m your malignancy of the astrocytes, which are your um, glial cells, which maintain the homeostasis and uh, help with myelination and help support the neurons. So if there is a malignancy of your astrocytes, we call that an astrocytoma. And it's one of the most common highly malignant primary brain tumor with a one-year median survival rate. Hence, it's extremely important for us as students and future physicians that we learn about the glioblastoma. And um, the thing about this one is it can cross the corpus callosum, as we can see over here, and it forms a butterfly glioma. So more often than none, uh, you will, will use uh, this exact um, pictures over here. And when you do see this, these pictures, you realize that glioblastoma over here is somewhat of a central lesion. Uh, it could also be a per, uh, peripheral lesion, but over here, you can see that this, that this lesion, it crosses the corpus callosum and it forms a butterfly lesion in the center. Uh, very different from this one over here, which is a peripheral lesion, peripheral lesion somewhat uh, the schwannoma is also a type of a uh, uh, quite of a peripheral lesion because it forms at the cerebellar pontine angle. It's not at the at the, at the, at the center. So your glioblastoma is uh, somewhat of a center lesion, which will cross the corpus callosum and form a butterfly glioma. So whenever you see this image in your question stem, uh, and with sign symptoms of tumors. And it's, and it's an adult patient, uh, the question, the, the, the answer more often than none is glioblastoma. Let's move on to the pathological report, which mentions that it's an astrocytic origin, uh, GFAP positive, which stands for glial fibrillary acidic protein. It's a type of stain, not very high yield to remember the full abbreviation of GFAP, but they will mention in the answer stem if they try to make it a bit harder if they try to make the question a bit harder mm -hmm. they will mention about this thing indicating that it's a glioblastoma uh, next what they mentioned is uh, it's a pseudo palisading pleomorphic tumor cells which means that uh, pseudo palisading means that the tumor cells are lined up against one another which it looks like uh, he, uh, but it's not Hence, the word pseudo and palisading means uh, cells lined up along one another. So pseudo palisading are your cells over here. You see them lining one after another, your hyperchromatic cells, which encircles an area of an, uh, necrosis in this case, or it could either encircle a center area of a hemorrhage or a microvascular pro proliferation. But more often than none, again, you will get a picture very similar or at this exact same picture in your question bank in UWorld or in any other question bank for that matters. So that's what it says. It says that it's a pseudopalisating pleomorphic tumor cells which will border a central area of necrosis, hemorrhage or microvascular pro proliferation. Um, once you understand how the whole thing presents with, um, it becomes very easy. So I want you to put a lot of emphasis on this tumor over here. The next one is your oligodendroglioma, not very, very high yield, not as high yield as your glioblastoma for obvious reasons, because it's a relatively rare tumor. And most often it's present in the frontal lobe, not very high yield. They don't really ask you where most often the tumor is or isn't. But what they do ask you is whether you know what tumor they're referring to once they present a question with this with this picture i'm sorry not this one this is not very common this one is which shows the pathological report of an of an of an oligodendrobioma which shows that these cells have a fried egg cells uh round nuclei with a clear cytoplasm over here so you see these cells uh which looks somewhat of a sunny side up egg with your fried egg hyperchromatic nuclei surrounding the, you see the clear cytoplasm, which resembles the white portion of your sunny side up morning breakfast egg. So this is what an 
um, the glymine. So this is what an oligodendroglyma looks like. Along with that, they also mentioned that there's a presence of a chicken wire capillary pattern. So these wires over here, they look somewhat like a chicken wire. For those of us who does not know or is not accustomed to what a chicken wire is, I'm just I'm just gonna mention this in Google and come up with an image of a chicken wire which looks like this. So this is what uh, they mean by a chicken wire capillary pattern. This is what a chicken wire looks like. It's present in some fences, uh, which they use over here, as you can see, to guard off, use as a barrier for chickens. And this resembles this chicken wire capillary pattern. The way I try to remember this oligodendroglyoma and the fried egg and chicken um, thing over here is um, you, you will get a lot of information in USMLE first aid step one for tumors with fried egg cells and the way i try to remember that all that that oligodendroglyoma has a fried egg cells nuclei with clear cytoplasm and chicken wire capillary pattern is uh i try to think of it it's a pretty silly way to um memorize this but it works for me so this is this is what i do which is i try to remember I, I i try to make up a picture in my head that there is a little kid called ollie who likes to have breakfast with fried eggs and chicken and uh, this helps me really remember that ollie likes to have fried eggs and chicken in the morning so morning sunny side up egg that's your fried eggs and your chicken wire capillary pattern for oligodendroglyoma <clears throat> And um, it's often calcified, not very high yield. Then the uh, next one is a pretty high yield tumor for USMLE step one, which is your meningioma. The <clears throat> the thing about the thing about meningioma is, excuse me, the thing about meningioma is, um, although the word meningioma has the word men in it, but meningioma is relatively very uncommon in males in men so meningioma is uncommon in men it's common in females most often occurs near the surface of brain in parasitical region as i mentioned before that uh, most of the adult primary brain tumors uh, in first aid step one pictures they present as peripheral lesion except glioblastoma multiforme which presents with a butterfly glioma with um, the lesion crossing the corpus callosum so uh, the, the, this is how you can differentiate a meningioma from any other peripheral brain lesion is uh, the meningioma will have, um, they will present with, okay, I'm sorry, they will present with a dural attachment, which is, which is your tail. So you see this one over here, this is a dural attachment to the meningioma, which makes sense because it's a malignancy of the meningeal layers. So there will be an attachment which looks or resembles a tail from the dural layer. So uh, meningiomas have an attachment. Um, and this helps me figure out that these scans, uh, they are referring to no other tumor except meningioma. Um, the way I try to remember the um, uh, histological, histological reports are uh, spindle cells concentrically arranged in a world pattern and with some of my bodies. So uh, the, uh, there are there is another benign tumor in females, which are your which are fibroids, which also have a world pattern, which basically looks like it's going round and round and in, in circles. So um, fibroid also has a similar uh, world pattern appearance and fibroids are, are obviously, I mean, they, they are the, your benign tumors of the uterus in females and meningiomas are more common in females. So, so whenever I see um, a, a pathological report like this one with signs symptoms of brain tumors and I see this world patterns, um, the first primary brain tumor which comes to my mind is meningioma. Along with the world pattern, you have your spindle cells over here. So spindle cells are so spindle cells are basically cells which have a longer cell size. They are not that wide. They almost look like a spindle. Their spindle cells are usually present in a healthy. Uh, uh, they could be 
I mean, they could either be a normal spindle cell like your fibroblast, which, which have a spindle cell appearance, or they could also be present. I mean, they could, they could also be, yeah, they could also be present in uh, primary brain tumors like meningioma and also in schwannomas over here, which I will come a bit later. So that's your meningiomas over here. What you have to remember about meningioma is it's a high yield tum tumor for step one, extremely uh, more common in females. It's a benign tumor, has a peripheral attachment, and they have a dura, mat uh, dura matter tail-like attachments for and um, in the in the pathological report, you will see there's a whorl pattern of the cells and the cells are spindle shaped cells. And another thing what you have to remember is uh, they will get calcified and thus form your subnormal bodies, which are laminated calcifications. Um, this can be treated by, re by resection or radio surgery, not important. Um, they may present with seizures or focal neuro neurological signs as any other brain tumor. So that's that. And, Let's move on to the next one, which is, which is your hemangioblastoma. Uh, I mentioned in my previous lecture that I will uh, talk a bit more about hemangioblastoma in this one. But um, what so what we can see is uh, it's associated with von hippel lindau syndrome, the uh, neurokidney disorder, which uh, we mentioned in uh, which I mentioned in the last lecture is von hippel lindau syndrome is basically your syndrome of your neurological tumor and your cutaneous disease consisting of hemangioblastomas and geomatosis, um, most commonly your retinal angiomas, bilateral renal cell carcinomas, a very common presentation in VHO disease and fear chromocytomas. And hemangioblastoma is associated with von hippel lindau syndrome and it can also produce erythropoietin, which will lead to secondary polycythemia due to the fact that your uh, the short arm of the chromosome number three, where there is where there is deletion of the von hippel lindau gene, it is responsible. It, it is responsible for ubiquitinization of the hypoxia inducible factor one a. So once that goes away, uh, the patient undergoes hypoxia. And uh, this results in formation of erythropoietin and your secondary polycythemia. And um, the, uh, in the, this lecture over here, they all they, they mentioned before that it's a highly vascular tumor with a hyperchromatic nuclei. So they might present. With, I mean, uh, in U world, you will get this sentence over here. Uh, indicating that it's a hemangioblastoma, which is your highly vascular tumor with your hyperchromatic nuclei. Or you might also get this sentence, which is closely arranged, thin-walled capillaries with minimal intervening parenchyma. So you see H over here. And this is your closely arranged thin wall capillaries with minimal intervening parenchyma, which resembles that the cells are very closely lined with each other. And there are not much of the parenchyma, which is present in, in, in between these cells, which resembles a hemangioblastoma. Also the fact that it's a highly vascularized cell. So you see the, these blood vessels over here and also the cells are hyperchromatic. I mean, they have new, they have, they have a very hyperchromatic nuclei. So this is your hemangioblastoma. Uh, the next two tumors, which we will go to, um, before we do go to them, we have to realize that there is a high possibility that we might overlap all the informations, which we just uh, learned in this picture over here. So what I do ask is I ask everyone or I ask most of my students is I ask them to take a, a picture of this uh, portion from the book in their cell phone. So what I want you to do is uh, after reading 
this whole lecture, I mean, this uh, reading this whole page and going through this lecture, I want you to take a picture of these um, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, these pictures in your phone. And whenever you get a chance, let's say you are going through your phones and you come across this picture, I want you to go through them and uh, and I want you to uh, recall which picture indicates which uh, tumors. So just a very small recapitulation. This is your glioblastoma multiforme, uh, central lesion crossing the corpus callosum, forming a butterfly glioma. You have your pseudopalisading uh, cells lined up with a central area of necrosis uh, microvascular proliferation or your hemorrhage. This is an oligodendroglioma without the dural attachment, without the tail, which means that it, 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 it more often than none, it's an oligodendroglioma. And then, as I mentioned before, that Ollie likes to have fried eggs and chicken in the morning, which are your fried um, egg cells, nuclei with central clear cytoplasm over here and your chicken wire capillary pattern network basically meaning that the capillaries are arranged in a chicken wire pattern the next one is your meningioma uh, the cells are arranged in a world pattern uh, I, try, I try to remember this by the tumor fibroid which happens in females which is a benign tumor of the uterus and um, this is also a very common tumor in females. So the, I try to remember that meningiomas have a world pattern with spindle cells. And this one over here is your hemangioblastoma. And uh, they have uh, hyperchromatic nuclei and highly, then they, they are highly vascular and they have, they are closely arranged, thin walled capillaries with minimal intervening parenchyma. So, that's that. Uh, before we move on to the next page, I want to discuss another um, another topic, which is drop metastasis. D R O P. Drop metastasis. So drop metastasis is basically when you have a primary brain tumor, and uh, during the initial debulking surgery of the tumor, it will metastasize from the uh, brain to the cerebellum or the spinal cord, and that phenomenon is called a drop metastasis. So uh, one of the main tumors which will undergo this phenomenon is your glioblastoma multiforme. So whenever you receive a question in your exam asking you which tumor has a tendency of um, having a drop metastasis as a phenomenon, uh, I want you to realize that they are directing you to glioblastoma multiforme. Okay, so the next two are pretty easy and extremely high yield comparatively to these ones over here because the signs and symptoms of these ones will overlap. The only differentiating points are your pathological reports over here. So I encourage you to once again take pictures of them in your cell phone and go over to them time and time again and try to see if you can remember which pathological report represents which tumors. The next one is your basic pituitary adenoma. Uh, it may be non-functional, meaning that it does not produce any hormone or it could be hyper-functioning, which means it will produce a hormone. Uh, the non-functional tumor is present with a mass effect, which, which means that it will present on the optic chiasm over here. That's what they said, and that's what it is. And once they do do that, you will the patient will complain of bitemporal hemianopia. And uh, this is extremely, extremely high yield. You will receive questions uh, from pituitary adenoma more often than none. And whenever you see a question stem about a patient complaining of, let's say, he was driving and then out of nowhere, he had an accident and then during an examination by a neurologist, um, the patient had the, uh, the, I mean, the examination findings said that the patient has a bitemporal, bitemporal hemianopia. The first tumor which you should have in your mind after you read that is your pituitary adenoma. 
And whenever you come across a question about pituitary adenoma, the first um, adenoma, which you should come to your head is prolactinoma. Prolactinoma is classically the most common type of pituitary adenoma, which the patient might or will present with. And if there is uh, prolactinoma, the classic signs and, and symptoms are your galacturia, the patient will, will complain of amenorrhea, uh, bone pain due to decreased bone, de bone density because uh, it's a non-functioning tumor. There will be decreased production of your follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone, and it will decrease the est estrogen in women and decrease libido. And in male, it will also decrease libido and cause infertility. The treatment for prolactinoma is very high yield. They will ask you this in your exam that they that we use dopamine ag agonists, example, bromocriptin and capricolin. And if we have to do a surgery, the surgery is called transphenoidal resection, not high yield. I have not come across a question where they ask you what surgery is done for pituitary adenoma, but if they do, uh, just try to remember that it's transphenoidal resection for pituitary aden adenoma. The histology of pituitary adenoma is not extremely high yield. I mean, it's comparatively high yield, but it's not as high yield as the histological reports of these tumors. So, uh, okay, so um, this, the histology mentions that it's a hyperplasia of one, of only one type of endocrine cells found in pituitary, most commonly from the lactotrophs, as I mentioned before, that the most common type of a pituitary adenoma is a prolactinoma, which is uh, the malignancy of your um, lactotrophs, I mean, a benign malignancy of your lactotrophs, which will result in hyper, hyper prolactin, uh, which will, I'm sorry, which will present with hyper prolactinemia and the signs symptoms mentioned over here. And uh, if it's from any other cells of the, of the, anterior pituitary, then it uh, it could be from the somatotrophs overproducing uh, growth hormone, just as I mentioned over here, that it, if it's a hyper-functioning tumor, which is a hormone-producing hormone, hormone producing tumor, then they will produce excess hormones. And um, growth hormone, uh, I mean, a uh, tumor of the somatotrophs will produce growth hormone, resulting in acromegaly, gigantism. And if it's from a from a, from a corticotroph, they will produce excess ACTH, resulting in Cushing disease. And it's very rare that uh, the pituitary tumor could be from the thyrotrophs, but if it is, then there is excess production of TSH and your signs symptoms of hyperthyroidism. Uh, all these things I'm sure you're familiar with from your endocrine topic. If not, I will make uh, my lectures on the endocrinology very soon, and I will go through them. But since we are just studying about the primary brain tumors, this is all that you need to know for pituitary adenoma. The last one is also extremely high yield, schwannoma, which classically will present at the cerebellopontine angle, which is over here. And it will involve the fifth, seventh, and eighth um, cranial nerve but it can be along any other peripheral nerve, but more often than not, it mostly affects CN7 and CN8. It's often localized to CN8, uh, which is your vestibular ocular nerve and the internal acoustic meatus. And I'm sure we remember from our previous lectures that in this neurocutaneous disorder, which is your neurofibromatosis type 2, which is an autosomal dominant disorder happening because there is a mutation in NF2 tumor suppressor gene on chromosome number 22 that I asked you guys to remember the word 2 for chromosome number 22 and also that in this syndrome, it affects two ears and two eyes. And for two ears, I mentioned before that it's bilateral vestibular schwannomas and um, two eyes for two cataracts. So uh, schwannomas are 
found in neurofibromatosis type 2. Uh, resection or stereotactic radiosurgery is what we do to treat a schwannoma, not high yield at all. You will not come across a question or very rarely will you do come across a question where they will ask you about the surgical treatment of schwannoma. But if they do, it's uh, stereotactic radius, radio surgery, not high yield. For the histological report, uh, schwannomas are basically your uh, tumors of Schwann cells. Schwann cells are your major myelinating cells for the peripheral nervous system, not the central nervous system, because the cells which are responsible for myelinating the central nervous systems are oligodendrocytes, and the cells which are responsible for myelinating the peripheral nervous systems are your Schwann cells. They are S100 positive, meaning that it's a neural crest derivative, S100 positive, that's what they indicate. So uh, cells which will stain which with S100 positive are derived from the neural crest. It's a biphasic dense hypercellular areas containing spindle cells, and then you have your spindle cells over here again, but this time they are not arranged in world patterns. So whenever you see spindle cells in world patterns, they are indicating uh, meningioma, but spindle cells without world patterns and surrounded by hypocellular myxoid areas, they are indicating that it's a schwannoma. So that's done for your, I mean, that's it for your adult primary brain tumor. So just a quick recap, you see a uh, question in your question stem where they are presenting with signs symptoms of a morning headache, seizure, uh, epilepsy or seizure or personality changes or focal neurological deficits, along with the fact that the patient is an adult. The first, uh, the answers should be any one of this six, which is G-O-M-H-P-S, uh, get out my head pains and uh, glioblastoma, oligodendroglioma, um, then meningioma, hemangioblastoma, pituitary adenoma, and schwannoma. So get out my head pains. And then accordingly, they will present with either a scan or a report, and they will ask you, I mean, they will uh, try to test you by seeing that whether you know that uh, the tumors which they are directing to you are the, are the adult primary brain tumors, not the pediatric brain tumors. And also, if they try to kick it up a notch and make the question a bit harder, they will try to test you by putting either one of these histological reports in the answer stem. And if you can try to remember the ways I just mentioned before, for reviewing or recalling the um, reports over here, then you should be good knowing that pseudopalisading cells with central areas for glioblastoma, fried egg cells for chicken wire for meningioma, spindle cells with world patterns, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, fried egg cells with chicken wires for awk, for like oligodendroglioma, uh, spindle cells with world patterns for meningiomas, and then hyperchromatic hypervascular cells with minimal intervening parenchyma for hemangioblastoma and spindle cells with world patterns for meningioma and spindle cells without world patterns for your schwannomas. And, uh, and then you have your pituitary adenomas, which they have not mentioned um, any uh, histological reports of how the cells are, but uh, they will present with bitemporal hemianopia and sign symptoms of a hyperfunctioning pituitary adenoma, such as uh, your most common pro your most common prolactinoma, which will be present with amenorrhea, um, decreased bone density, and decreased decreased libido and infertility. In case of osomatotrophs, acromegaly gigantism, acromegaly in in elder patients, and gigantism in um, when, when the tumor is is present in a very young age. And also, if it's a if it's a corticotrop, then the patient will have a, a, a Cushing disease, and very rarely, a pituitary adenoma will be a thyrotropic adenoma, for which the patient will have hyperthyroid 
for which the patient will have hyperthyroidism. <clears throat> so this is the entire lecture for the adult primary brain tumor. Uh, I hope I could narrow the high yield points for uh, with which you can do an easy review or recall, but try to remember that you have to take pictures of these things into your cell phone or your laptop with which you can come across every other day and try to really test yourself to see if you know which pathological report indicates which tumor. So that's that, hope it helps. And uh, please let me know if there is anything else in particular you would like me to cover and best of luck.